In this unit, we will cover the quality assessment and quality control process that happens within the clinical laboratory. So with this particular PowerPoint, we're going to look at quality assessment in general. So whether you're taking this particular course just to kind of see what the medical laboratory field is about, or whether you're just entering into the program, you're going to learn pretty quick that Healthcare in general has a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that ensures that everything is following regulations. We'll take a look at why those regulations are set and kind of explore the fact that there's always something going on behind the scenes to make sure that patients are safe in the healthcare setting, that employees are safe, and that you're sending out quality results within the laboratory. So one of the definitions of quality is a degree of excellence. So if you understand that, then you kind of understand what the value of quality is as it relates to the clinical laboratory. We're looking for a degree of excellence. So the laboratory test in general that we send out as a laboratory technician, it plays a very decisive role in the decision-making process that a provider will have for an individual patient or public health or research or anything that's gonna rely on the result of that test. So making sure that those results are sent out with an excellence behind them. So in other words, there's all sorts of quality checks to ensure that that result is accurate. Um, what we're doing is reducing any sort, of, um, any sort of harm that could come to a patient if that result was not valid or if it was not a quality result that we're sending out. So in part of that process to make sure that we're reducing any sort of harm to the patient, there are several things that are looked at, which would include things like making sure that the appropriate test was ordered or that the physician's not inappropriately ordering tests to try to diagnose something that that particular test is not going to aid in that diagnosis, which in other words could increase costs, it's wasting time, it's wasting resources. So those are things that are or looked at in the whole quality management type um, setting. So we look at things like that. We look to make sure that results aren't delayed or any possible reasons why results could be delayed um, or missing any of those test results due to um, inappropriate ordering, things like that. So there's a lot of factors that go into play that look at, at making sure that quality is maintained within the laboratory setting. So we're going to kind of touch on some of those various things. So depending on the particular healthcare system or organization that you're in, um, there may be a quality, quality management team or it could just be an individual that's working on the different quality policies and procedures for that particular facility or that lab. And so what this does is it generates a quality um, program, which is basically a collection of document processes, procedures, responsibilities. Um, it's going to cover things like staffing, um, making sure that the people that are running those tests have the proper education, that they have um, the proper training, that everything's documented, that they get refreshers on those trainings um, to make sure that they understand how to run those tests and the various validation process that are involved, involved in um, making sure that those tests are sent out with accurate results. And this is going to include things like making sure the machines are functioning, functioning properly, making sure that quality checks are being performed, that maintenance is being done, that you're comparing your results across um, a testing platform against results from other facilities to make sure that um, you're kind of staying in the standards with other people in the same field and in the same industry that you're doing. So we're going to learn a little bit about what some of those things are. So part of that quality management team or that person is going to be looking to make sure that your plan for quality within that lab um, includes any sort of quality assurance policies as well as quality control. And so what your goal is to make sure that you're achieving a 99% level of quality, which means you only have about a 1% error rate. 
Now, ideally, we wouldn't want to have any errors, but we are human. Things do happen and mistakes do happen or things kind of slip through the cracks. So making sure you have some sort of system in place to catch things like that is very valuable in the laboratory setting. So one of the sayings that we like to use in the laboratory setting is that the result is only as good as the specimen. So in other words, if something's wrong with the specimen, if it's contaminated, if it's not properly stored, then those things are going to affect your results. So making sure that the processes before you ever get the sample to test it have been performed correctly is essential. And so part of that process is understanding the specimen itself. So most of what you're going to deal with will be blood and urine in a clinical laboratory setting. However, there are other things that um, you will encounter as far as uh, of specimens that are submitted to the lab. So this could be different body tissues, body fluids, um, different uh, joint fluids or um, fluid from around the heart or the lungs, um, semen specimens, uh, culture specimens. So it could be a wound culture um, from a tissue site within the body. Um, so there are various things that you will encounter, but a bulk of what you're going to handle will be blood and urine. And so it's most important that you make sure that those processes for collecting that specimen, um, making sure that that specimen is properly labeled, that the patient was identified, that it was properly collected, transported, stored, all those things factor into making sure that that result that you send out is a quality result. And so making sure all those processes that go into um, collecting that specimen and ordering that test and getting it to you to actually do the test that everything's been done before you actually test that sample, which includes making sure that you've run um, quality control samples for that particular test method to make sure that your analyzer or the processes and steps and reagents that you're using are still um, valid, all valid and that you are sending out results that are accurate. So again, um, by the enactment of that CLIA Act in 1988, um, that kind of set the standards for quality within the laboratory setting. So that was a very important, um, important thing to come out was the establishment of these rules that kind of govern the basic minimum um, quality aspects within the laboratory. So they've kind of set the standards of what they expect you to do to make sure that you, your whole overall quality assessment process encompasses enough detail to prevent any sort of major errors that are going to affect the patient. And by doing this, following these uh, regulations, then you're kind of helping to ensure that that phase of testing is actually going to allow you to send out accurate results and that's reducing any sort of harm to the patient um, because of those results if you were to send out inaccurate results and so making sure that you follow these rules that were established by CLIA at a minimum is going to help reduce any sort of errors so again Everything that we're kind of referring to throughout your studies in the MDL program are all going to kind of lead back to the regulations that CLIA has set for quality standards. So anything that we're kind of um, trying to educate you with as far as a standard, it's not because somebody is nitpicking over whether or not you do quality control one time a day or three times a day. It's all rules behind why you do this at these intervals and why you do certain things the way that we do them. And that's because of these CLIA acts. So if CLIA comes in and inspects, inspects your laboratory and they see that you're not doing some of these standards, then they're going to issue a de deficiency. And based on the deficiency and the level of it, they could potentially shut that laboratory down or they could um, fix it in a way that you do not get any kind of CMS re reimbursement. And once you're flagged on that list, then no insurance company or anyone is going to pay for those test results that you send out because they view them as, as inaccurate and that they're not going to benefit the patient. So making sure you maintain those quality standards is very essential in the laboratory setting. 
Now, depending on the organization, if you're in a smaller doctor's office, um, most likely they're going to be inspected and regulated by CLIA or COLA, depending on what that, that office chooses. Or if you're in a um, reference lab, it could have those kind of same um, regulatory requirements as a physician's office would, but a little bit higher standard because of the, the particular testing that is being done. Um, but within a hospital setting, the Joint Commission kind of um, adds a little bit extra to those requirements for a laboratory setting. And this is because within a hospital setting, the testing that you're doing is more complex and there's a little bit more involved when you're in a hospital setting as far as it relates to patients and um, the whole healthcare network within that hospital setting. So the Joint Commission does set a little bit of a higher standard, so they expect you to um, do voluntary accreditation with some different organizations that have a little bit higher standards on their regulations and expectations for your quality assessment and quality plan for that laboratory. And the Joint Commission will also do reviews of the lab within that hospital setting. So while they're inspecting the standards of the hospital healthcare system in general, they're also going to kind of come in in those sub areas of the hospital, like the laboratory and radiology and different areas of that hospital setting and make sure that they are adhering to those standards by those accrediting agencies. So the ISO actually helps with uh, setting some of those standards for you to follow within the laboratory. And part of that is using the Six Sigma process, which actually helps you to kind of assess various areas and determine um, different things that could help with that process, with a particular process of a quality assessment. And so with the Six Sigma, you kind of go through a process of looking at different aspects and determining if that particular aspect is met and if not, kind of circling back to see what you can do to kind of prove that particular um, standard that you're looking at. And so it looks for a, a gap in anything that could create a problem um, for that particular standard. So this kind of helps with your day-to-day -day operations and looking at some of your process to see if there's anything that can improve or prevent an unwanted outcome. A lot of your hospital laboratories like to take it a step beyond what the general requirements are on a CLIA-based setting. Um, they like to do a little bit more of a stringent uh, quality control plan because you are running your laboratory on multiple shifts throughout the day, whereas opposed to a physician's office laboratory is usually going to be an eight, ten hour day. Um, so by doing a voluntary accreditation with an organization like CAP, then that kind of helps to implement an extra step in that quality assessment system. And so you're looking at a little bit more stringent regulations as far as quality control testing and different policies and procedures that you have in place. But because you are running a lab 24 seven, this kind of helps to ensure that you're maintaining your quality throughout every shift, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So a lot of your hospital labs will do um, CAP accreditation. So once you get into the laboratory setting, um, you may start hearing something that will be referred to as Lean Six Sigma. So this is kind of a process in which you look at and you kind of combine the, the context of Lean with the context of Six Sigma. And you're looking at things like, how can we reduce waste but still send out quality results? And so you use that Six Sigma process to kind of evaluate the different areas of whatever you're focusing on. Um, and then include that lean process to kind of help um, redesign your workflow within the lab. If you have a high volume lab, what are some steps that can be taken to kind of reduce um, the amount of steps that your employees have to take to send out a result? Um, you're looking at things that will help kind of cut back on waste of time, waste of supplies, waste of resources. Um, wasting the time that you're using that actual tech to do that particular task. If you can reduce the time that takes them to do this task, then that allows them more time to do another task that may require a little bit more attention. 
So the Lean Six Sigma looks at the whole process from beginning to end to see if there are any ways in which you can improve that process. Now an example of that Lean Six Sigma process may be that they're looking at a particular analyzer in the room. You know, maybe a tech has come up and said, look, you know, this, this analyzer on this side of the room, it, it's great for first ship, but for second and third ship, because this and this, this and this, um, we're having to take more steps to go across the room to do this particular process. So if we could move this analyzer on this side of the room, then um, that's going to reduce this process and save me some time and I can focus more on this particular task. And so part of that lean process is um, to kind of put out there that, hey, it's not possible that you can over communicate. So if there's an issue, making sure that you voice that issue um, and com communicate that issue, um, you can't over communicate. Um, if you're going to have a delay in sending out a result that a physician is waiting on, you know, making sure you communicate why that delay is happening. Um, call a physician and say, hey, um, the probe on my machine just broke, so I've got to replace that. It's going to take me about an hour, and I've got a QC once I get it up. So we're looking at about an hour and a half to get your results. Um, so making sure you communicate things is good. You're continuously focusing on improvement. You're looking at areas in which you can improve a task or improve how something is done. And so again, like I said, if for the for example, if you notice that moving an analyzer to another side of the room is going to be more beneficial to the workflow, then that might be something that needs to be looked at with that Six Sigma Lean process. Um, you need to engage in all aspects of the organization, not just a core team. So you kind of need to look at it from a standpoint, what is going to happen with your, your position, your role that could affect beyond the laboratory setting. Um, getting out those results faster is going to benefit the patient and benefit the provider that is caring for that patient. So you've got to look at beyond just your particular role. Actions speak louder than words. So doing a role the best that you can is going to be better than just saying, hey, if we do this, this, and this, um, this is going to help us. But being able to show and demonstrate and prove that is part of that process. Ideas flow from the bottom up. So hey, when you're working in the lab and you're doing the job um, five days a week, eight hours a day, or whatever your schedule is, you're the one that's doing the job. So you kind of understand the process and the flow. Where someone in management who may just walk through your department to check in you know, a few times a day, they're not doing that job. They don't see that workflow, so they don't really have those ideas. So making sure that you bring up those ideas um, from an actual user level is the better way to go. Be respectful to every individual. Listen to and seriously consider their ideas. So you might have an idea that you present that makes the workflow better. However, somebody else on another shift say, well, you know, yeah, that's that's great, but if we do this, it's going to affect this, this, and this. So you always kind of got to be mindful that your idea may affect someone else as well. A feedback loop um, is critical to the to overcome any sort of challenge. So making sure whoever's involved in that process is constantly um, putting input forth is a great idea. And staff must be accountable to achieve success. So if something is implemented, if a change is implemented, then making sure everybody's on board, everyone's educated, and everyone is on the same page is going to be your best way to achieve success for that particular task. So now let's take a look at what is quality assessment as a whole. So quality assessment encompasses the policies that are going to maintain and control the processes that are involved with the patient testing and the analysis of um, your sample. And so because of that, we look at different external standards that have been set to ensure that we are sending out quality results um, through that quality assessment plan. And so this plan, having a quality assessment plan is a CLIA regulation. Um, so CLIA is a part of CMS. So they're going to inspect you or they're going to ensure that you've been inspected by some sort of accreditation agency to make sure that you have that quality assessment policy in place. 
So a clinical laboratory has to be certified, uh, has to be certified by CMS or some sort of other agency. So again, um, this is where your inspectors from CLIA or CAP, Joint Commission, somebody, a COLA, they're going to come in and inspect you to make sure that you've met all those standards that have been set forth by CLIA. And so this is going to include things like making sure you do proficiency testing. So one of the acronyms that we use in the lab is PT. Um, so there are a lot of things that go by PT. So PT could um, be an acronym for proficiency testing. It could be an acronym for a prothrombin test. It could be an acronym for patients. Sometimes people, if they're writing notes, leaving it for somebody else, they'll be like, they may say something like, I've ran, um, ran this PT patient uh, twice and getting the same result. Can you take a look at this? Or um, PT testing came in today, so you're assigned sample number three. You know, run it by Friday. So you got to kind of understand when you see PT, what is it being used for? What's it being abbreviated uh, for? Um, so once the lab has been certified, the laboratory is scheduled for regular inspections, which is about every two years, unless there's some sort of deficiency that's noted. Um, then they may get inspections a little bit sooner. Or if there's a complaint that's launched, then they could get a pop-in um, inspection. But laboratories are to be inspected on a regular basis that's been set by CLIA. And so when we talk about being inspected, we're talking about um, someone who is outside of that organization who's been trained of what to look for, what to assess, will come in they will ask for records, they will ask for procedure manuals, they'll look for various things that are on that list of your um, CLIA requirements to see that you are doing as CLIA has defined in their regulations. Part of your quality assessment plan includes um, looking for any sort of active or latent errors. So your active errors tend to be the ones that are more obvious and these are the ones that usually um, happen more at the beginning. So between um, the healthcare workers interaction with the patient, um, somewhere between there and you actually getting the specimen, there's usually some sort of error that can happen versus a latent error, error which is a little bit less obvious. Um, and these errors are basically something that is waiting to happen. Um, so you may not realize it until after the error has happened. So when we look at active er errors, this could include things like not properly identifying the patient when you get the sample, um, missing the vein when you stick the patient or causing some sort of injury there, um, errors with anticoagulants in the collection tube, so not using the proper tube or um, using an old tube, things like that. Errors in transporting, um, so like for a hospital setting when they're using those mnemonic tube stations or something similar to what the banks use when you're, if you go to a bank um, and they have those little tube things that you can be three lanes over from the window and then put your put your money in the tube and send it through the system. Um, so some of your hospitals have these mnemonic tube systems um, and occasionally things happen with that. Samples may get lost in it. Um, maybe the sample wasn't transported on ice if it was required to be on ice, or um, maybe it's a really hot day and somebody picks up a sample from an office and forgets to put it in a cooler and the sample sits in the car and it cooks. So these are kind of some examples with errors, errors in ordering or um, errors with the machine or anything like that. Some examples of latent errors would be things like staffing problems, which we're actually seeing a lot of right now. There's a, a large um, shortage right now of lab techs and actually a lot of positions within the healthcare field. So staffing problems can cause issues. If you've got staff that are working overtime, um, you've got them working second shift and then coming back the next day for first shift, so they may not have got a lot of sleep or things like that can cause errors if you don't have enough people to cover um, all areas. 
um, information technology issues. So maybe the analyzer is not interfaced with the laboratory um, information system or the computer system that's going to report out those results. So maybe you've got to manually key in results. Um, so this is a place where maybe there can be some errors that will happen. Um, equipment malfunctions, um, the particular layout of the lab, um, policies and procedures that um, don't cover a particular um, a particular detail that may be needed for a particular test. Um, teamwork issues, so you've got staff that can't get along, so they're not communicating properly. Um, management issues, if you've got um, management that maybe is not listening to staff on particular issues, maybe they're bringing it up to management and management's like, well, we, that's not something we can focus on right now. Um, so there are a lot of things that can cause latent errors that aren't even on this list, but you can kind of see that there are things that maybe are um, things that could probably potentially cause a problem down the road. So maybe it's not a direct effect right now, but as time goes on, you can kind of foresee something happen. So it's kind of like knowing that the accident's going to happen, you just don't know when. So part of your process for quality assessment is trying to look at ways to improve some of these processes. So maybe you see that that wreck getting ready to happen. Maybe you kind of see that something at some point is going to go bad. So you might have a process where you're using those lean and six, six sigma policies where you're just trying to figure out how to assess the situation. And so by doing that, what we're looking at is um, making sure that we're going to prevent any of those errors. So maybe that includes some sort of formal safety training for um, personnel. It could go beyond the laboratory. So maybe if you have nurses collecting samples and you're getting several samples that aren't collected properly. So maybe you do a re-education for the nurses or put out some sort of um, a flow chart or directions of how to collect that specimen. Enhancing communication, not only between um, healthcare staff, but also patients, making sure that they get the education they need. So if a particular test requires particular patient prep or the patient to be fasting, then making sure that the patient gets that information before that procedure is performed. Quality improvement projects um, that could involve patient outcomes and the data, different feedback um, from patients and staff or your nursing staff. This can all help with assessing these quality policies and procedures. Um, so making sure that you have some sort of plan to keep those policy processes in place and making sure you've got a constant plan to always be evaluating potential errors and things that can happen is part of that quality assessment and quality management process. Um, so when CLIA or CAP or whoever comes to inspect and they're looking at your policies and procedures and your quality assessment plan, they're going to ask you, what are you doing to make, make sure that you're always looking for the possibilities of errors? So you might have to prove to them that, hey, we're doing audits monthly, we're pulling um, 15 random patients and we're looking to make sure that um, the physician ordered all the required tests, that all the required tests, you know, they weren't over ordering that the process in that whole testing process was done properly. So they might look at, you might have to go back and pull QC records for that day um, to make sure quality control was done. Um, you might have a quality standard where you're looking at employee records to make sure that they were properly trained for their particular job. So there's a lot of things that you could look at in your quality assessment. And so when CLIA inspects you, they're going to be looking to see that you have those in place and that you've actually done them. And they're going to ask you if you've done a process that looks at all three phases of testing. Have you looked at the pre-analytical phase before you actually examine the specimen? Have you looked at the analytical phase where you actually look at the specimen? Have you looked at the post-analytical phase after you've examined the, the specimen and you've sent out results? Um, most of your errors that do happen are in that pre-analytical or post-analytical phase of testing. Um, and this is usually something related to 
the specimen collection or sending out those results. Again, if it's something like where you have to manually enter results, making sure that you have a second and third set of eyes to review those results might be part of your quality plan to make sure that you didn't um, clerically enter something wrong. With that pre and local phase of testing, um, some of the things that more prone to cause errors are, are things that are related to something that are just basic human error. Um, it can include making sure that you properly identified the, the patient, making sure that you put the correct specimen in the correct tube, that you transported it properly, um, making sure that that tube was properly filled. Some tubes require you to fill it to a certain line. And in that case, occasionally you may get it only half full and you have to reject that specimen. Um, so again, we kind of emphasize that saying of your result is only as good as the specimen. So making sure you have properly collected that specimen and everything going into that step is very essential for the rest of the process. So going back to proficiency testing, PT, you'll hear that referred to a lot. PT program, proficiency testing, PT samples. Um, you may walk into the lab one day and you have an email or you have a note or your supervisor comes to you and says, here's this PT sample, I need you to run it by Friday. Um, so what PT testing is, or proficiency testing, is a way for the laboratory to kind of um, check their self to make sure that they are meeting those standards. And so it is a part of your quality control um, or your quality assessment plan. And so the laboratory will participate in some sort of T PT program, which will send you samples periodically throughout the year. And this is a clear requirement that you are doing this. And that particular pro program um, that you pay for with your laboratory, they will send you those samples. You test those samples just like you would a regular patient. Um, of course, you'd have to follow the directions for that company that sends you that sample. Um, some of the companies that most people are more familiar with would be uh, CAP or CAP and MLE that sends out these samples. And there are a variety of programs out there that do this, but those are some of the main ones that you'll kind of encounter. Um, so once they send you those samples and you test them, they give you uh, a time frame. So it's usually about a week or two, depending on the, the sample or the, the company. When they send you those samples, you'll inspect them, run them, follow directions, run them, incorporate them within your testing workflow. There are requirements to this that are set by CLIA as far as making sure they're rotated throughout your staff, make sure they're rotated throughout shifts. Um, so these are all things that you have to look at when assigning proficiency testing to your employees. And then once you get those results, those results are sent back to the, the PT program. Um, and then they evaluate those results and then they send you um, kind of like a report card. So this is kind of like your exam for your laboratory. And then they send you a report card and tell you whether or not you passed. Um, and so once you've sent those results back and they evaluate them, they're going to compare you to other laboratories that are also participating in this program so that you can kind of see where you stand against other laboratories. Um, and so this kind of helps you to evaluate your quality of your lab. If you get back your report and you failed a particular content area, then you've got to evaluate it. You've got to look into it. Did, did this error affect my patients? Why did this error happen? And so they're going to make you send some sort of documentation to them to verify that you've looked into these problems. Um, when they come to inspect you, they're going to um, look to make sure that you've participated in the PT program and that you're getting, um, that you're passing those assessments. If you fail an assessment, then CLIA will get a report from that agency that you participate with. And then they're going to it's going to throw some flags. They're going to kind of get suspicious. If you fail one, they're just going to kind of throw a little red flag. We need to watch this. Once you get two back to back, um, then you're at risk for them um, stopping your funding and um, for them to come out and inspect you and try to find out what's going on. Why are you missing these? 
So PT testing is very important in the clinical laboratory setting. So those clear requirements do state that you have to run PT testing um, for or proficiency testing for your moderate and high complexity tests. And again, those test categories are set by the FDA. Um, if there's anything that is not FDA cleared, um, this is going to hit more for your research laboratories. Um, or if you perform something, a particular test, that there's no proficiency testing that's available for it. So in other words, a company hasn't developed any kind of test for that particular methodology yet, then you've got to have some way of verifying at least twice a year that that particular test method um, has been verified. So there are there are a few recommendations that they give you that what you can do for this. So it's usually something like um, sharing samples with another laboratory that does that same test and kind of comparing against each other. Uh, if it's a waived test, they do not require any sort of proficiency testing, but some places do opt to do proficiency testing on waived tests just as an extra quality control standard. Um, and so when you're doing proficiency testing, they're going to expect you to make sure that you follow any sort of policy procedure that you have uh, for monitoring those, um, those results. So making sure that you're constantly monitoring your QC, that there's somebody that's looking at that, making sure that um, you're sending out accurate and reliable results. So that's going to be part of your, pro your policy is to making, sh making sure that those QC procedures are always evaluated and reviewed. Um, and so your programs can be affected by new technologies and methods um, simply because things are constantly changing. So these PT programs are constantly having to adapt to new methodologies that are out there. So part of your quality assessment plan is ensuring that you are sending out accurate results and making sure that all your documentation is maintained. So over the years, um, the computer systems have kind of come into play with making sure um, that those computer systems are communicating properly, making sure that it's sending accurate data from one point to the next. Um, so there's a lot of different checks that you have to do when you're setting up a computer interface to make sure that everything is it's flowing properly. So making sure that the results that the machine gets is what it actually sends to the computer, that your computer interprets that digital code that is sent by that analyzer. And then from there, your computer system communicates with wherever it's going after it leaves you. So this could be physician's office um, or another hospital or going into the patient's chart within the hospital. So there are a lot of audits and checks and things that have to be done when setting up a computer system. And then within that computer system, there are a few things that can be done to make sure when you're actually reporting those results that you're sending out accurate results. One of those things is a Delta check system that um, will kind of help you in monitor monitoring those patient results. Um, so what a Delta check does is it will pop up a little flag. You can set some standards in your computer system where it will pop up a flag and compare results of your patient. So let's just say that you do um, a hemoglobin hematocrit and hematology on a patient and you test it this morning and it was 13.2. Uh, and then later this afternoon, you get another sample in, and that sample is 6.2. So that means that that patient has dropped their hemoglobin within, let's just say, a 12-hour period of 6 grams. And so you've got to kind of investigate if you've gotten a flag for your Delta check. That's a big drop in a short amount of time. Um, so you need, may need to investigate that. And a lot of times what you may find is maybe that specimen, one of those two specimens was collected on the wrong patient. Um, or maybe that second specimen that come in in the afternoon was contaminated and therefore it diluted out that specimen and that's why you got that big drop. 
So these are things that you're going to kind of start learning throughout the program and once you actually get into your clinical setting where you're going to kind of start seeing some of these things and, and start recognizing um, some of these things that are in that reporting system and that computer system as an extra check to kind of help you see that um, you could potentially be dealing with a problem specimen. So you could be potentially dealing with a pre-analytical error. And so the laboratory will constantly um, implement things to kind of help reduce these errors. And of course, with reducing errors, you're also reducing um, any sort of problem that could come to that patient. And let's say that you do find an error. Well, CLIA says that your documentation must include what you did to fix that error. So if an incident happens, um, let's just say in the scenario that I gave, where you suspect that that sample may be contaminated or it may be the wrong patient, then you've actually got a document that you looked into this error. Well, maybe you it was collected on the wrong patient, but the chemistry department has already sent out their results, but you found it when you were um, reporting out the hemoglobin hematocrit, so therefore you might have to to make a note and alert every every other department that had a sample collected on that particular stick that hey your results are probably in inaccurate because I think this was the wrong patient that stuck. So you kind of got to put some flags up so that everybody knows and you've got to work together and keep that communication open between each other and within each department to let them know that you found an error. Once you find the error you document it. Um, what did you do to correct it? Did you send out corrected reports within your laboratory system? Did you take those results out of the patient's chart? Did you give a, a credit in the billing aspect of it to the patient? Um, so CLIA requires that you have all this documentation in place to prove that not only did you find the error, not only that your system of finding and detecting errors is working, but it, you're also got a system in place to correct those errors and try to prevent them in the future.